Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and we appreciate your support on Patreon. There are links in the description. Thought experiments are critical to expanding our knowledge of the universe. Brilliant scientists like Einstein and Hawking used thought experiments to find solutions to problems decades before the technology existed to prove them correct. Let's do our own thought experiment today. Imagine that we have been working in our garage, experimenting and creating various inventions. When we discover the secret to building a small lattice aneutronic fusion reactor, this device generates up to a megawatt of power with no radiation and has a very low mass. This machine produces a steady stream of protons that you can harness in electromagnetic fields to produce electrical energy you would have a very powerful and efficient power source. We have a series of lessons on fusion energy, if you want to read up on this technology. Now, we have always dreamed of going into space, and we decide to build a small spaceship around this power source. We want it to be as small as possible, so it fits in the workshop. We start with a very small RV, like the Airstream Base Camp, and modify it for our purposes. I think we should always look at RV, yacht, cruise ship, and especially submarine designs when looking at building spaceships. When you go to Mars, do you want to travel eight months in something with an interior designed by NASA or something designed in Norway? We seal this with graphene wrapping and space-rated epoxy. This would all be expensive, but maybe we invested in Tesla back in 2013. We put an environmental control system up here. Remember, we will need only about one kilogram of oxygen per day at the most. And we can use lithium hydroxide canisters to remove the carbon dioxide for a short trip. We remove any air-breathing generators and make sure that everything is powered by electricity. We seal any open areas, then attach a Tesla power wall and solar panels for emergency power in case we have to shut down our reactor. Plugging them in right here. This RV comes with a 21-gallon water tank, which is almost 80 liters. We need almost 3 liters a day to drink, so this could last almost a month. We'll use alcohol wipes for hygiene. We won't be recycling. We install a waste disposal system and pack a lot of Ziploc bags. We'll remove any heavy parts we don't need to reduce mass. Then we can build a frame to support our propulsion system. We are going to keep our mass at about 2,000 kilograms. We'll calculate the propellant mass in a minute. When we finish it, we are going to want to take it on a test drive. I know in real life this would rapidly get us killed, but let's have some fun. We are going to fly to the moon, similar to the three astronauts on Apollo 8. We won't land. We'll just get close enough to have a nice view. This should take us about a week. But we need to first get to low Earth orbit. We can use the electricity from our fusion device to run an atmospheric ion engine. In an engine like this, the gas particles are funneled from the front, ionized, and thrown out the back. Here you see how one of these works. The gas is pulled in here. This is called the ram electric propulsion intake, ionized in this section and thrown out here. These devices were considered in the 1960s and 70s, but were not built at that time. Both the Japanese Space Agency and a company called BUSEC in the United States started working on these in the early 2000s, but Europe got there first. This intake was designed by Quinta Science out of Poland, while the entire thruster was produced by Sitail out of Italy. In this chamber, the air is compressed. Compression causes temperatures to rise, and the gas is therefore thermalized. This is then fed into the ionization chambers, where electrons are knocked off creating a collection of ions and electrons that we call a plasma. Plasmas can be controlled with electromagnetic fields, and we use these fields to accelerate these particles out the back, throwing them out at a very high velocity, which gives us thrust and efficiency. As we start moving, we create what we call a gathering flow, which works for a satellite orbiting at 7.8 kilometers per second, or for us at sea level once we get going. But to get the air started, we'll need to use ducted electric fans. 
We also won't need to compress the gas as much in thicker atmospheres, so this should be adjustable. Then we ionize the air, and it flows out the back at high velocity. This might sound like science fiction, but it is not. We cover these engines in depth in this lesson, and the European Space Agency built and tested the device in 2018. While it might work well for satellites with continuous solar power and an initial high velocity, it will take a lot of power to make it work efficiently on Earth. But since we have our lattice fusion device, we climb easily up into the air and on up above the Kármán line. Now we have a problem. Once we reach 250 kilometers, the atmosphere starts to get too thin to feed propellant to our engines, and we are stuck here. We can stay at this altitude and accelerate horizontally, reaching the 7,800 meters per second so we can stay in orbit without burning any of our onboard propellant. But we can't go on to the moon without a new plan. While on Earth we only needed power, as the atmosphere provided the propellant, in space, past low Earth orbit, we will need a propellant. We will now have to feed gas into this device or have separate ion thrusters or regular rocket engines to get us onto the moon. Our atmospheric engine is not optimized for this. Let's assume that we also have an array of very efficient magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, like those produced by neutron star systems out of Germany. These use high temperature superconducting magnets to help boost the efficiency of a Lorentz or MPD thruster. We have a nice lesson on this type of thruster here. And we cover all types of ion propulsion here. We want to get an efficiency of 5,000 seconds of specific impulse. A stretch, but we've got a lot of power to waste. Current systems are around 1,500 seconds. But up to 11,000 seconds is theoretically possible. With up to 200 newtons of force per thruster, this is all within our reach. For our propellant, we could carry tanks of argon up with us. This would be inexpensive and quite effective. It takes about 3,200 meters per second of delta V to go from low Earth orbit to a translunar trajectory orbit. Since we aren't going to go into orbit around the moon or land, we'll just get close to the moon and come back to Earth. We use the rocket equation to see how much propellant we will need to bring with us. We have the specific impulse and delta V needed. And remember, our ship had a mass of only 2,000 kilograms. We need to produce a delta V of about 3,200 meters per second, and we know that the specific impulse is 5,000 seconds. We can now try to find our final mass. So we rearrange our equation. Delta V equals the exhaust velocity times the natural log of initial mass over final mass. Delta V over exhaust velocity equals the natural log of initial mass over final mass. E is a constant, 2.7183, and we need it to get the inverse of log. E to the power of delta V over exhaust velocity equals initial mass over final mass. And now we move our final mass over and up here, while moving these over and down here. Now final mass equals initial mass divided by E to the power of delta V over exhaust velocity. Now we will turn our specific impulse into exhaust velocity using this equation. V E equals specific impulse times the force of gravity on Earth. We get our answer by multiplying our 5,000 seconds of specific impulse by 9.807 meters per second squared, the force of gravity on Earth. This gives us 49,035 meters per second for our exhaust velocity. So we will set our initial mass as 2,000 kilograms and plug in our numbers. Our final mass comes out as 1,874 kilograms. With that, we can calculate how much propellant we will need to take with us. 126 kilograms. That's the amazing potential of ion drives. We only need 126 kilograms of propellant to get the job done. To be safe, we'll bring one a little bigger, holding about 200 kilograms of propellant. Liquid argon has a density of 1,150 kilograms per cubic meter. For 200 kilograms of liquid argon, we will only need a volume of about 0.174 cubic meters. That means a sphere 28 centimeters across, about 11 inches can hold our propellant. We would only need one carbon overwrap pressure vessel about this size. Now we also need to worry about thrust. Propulsion efficiency tells you how much of your mass will need to be propellant to get to your destination, but thrust determines how long it will take you. 
Most ion propulsion systems have very low thrust. That means they have a very low acceleration. When a solar storm heated and expanded the Earth's atmosphere recently, the increased atmospheric density was a threat to SpaceX Starlink satellites as they tried to climb slowly to their higher orbits. Sadly, the atmospheric drag increased by 50%, and this was too much for the Krypton ion drives. The Starlink satellites could not stay in orbit and burned up in the atmosphere. We said earlier that magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters can produce up to 200 newtons of thrust. Let's have 10 of these thrusters putting out a total of 2,000 newtons. How fast would we go through our propellant? Another equation tells us that force equals exhaust velocity times mass propellant flow. In this case, the force is our thrust. Mass propellant flow is usually given as M dot. The dot system was developed by Isaac Newton when he reinvented calculus. This notation is called fluxion notation or dot notation. Another mathematician named Leibniz figured out calculus a long time after Newton, but published it about the same time. As Newton had procrastinated, Leibniz notations look like this. This is the same differential equation, now clearly saying the change in mass over the change in time. It's interesting to note that the two gentlemen disagreed about who was first, and the matter was settled by an organization headed by Sir Isaac Newton, who decided that he had, after all, been first. By the way, Babylonian clay tablets show that their astronomers, over 2,000 years ago, had developed a type of calculus to track the motions of the planets and stars. And we now know that the ancient Greek scholars, Eudoxus, and Archimedes had developed differential equations of their own, hundreds of years before the Babylonians. Imagine where we would be today if this knowledge had been better preserved. I like Leibniz's notation better, but it is traditional to use M dot in aerospace science. By the way, Newton used the notation V dot to indicate acceleration. So if you see that somewhere, it stands for the change in velocity over the change in time. Now we can rearrange the equation to solve for mass propellant flow, and we get m dot equals f over ve. In this case, 2,000 newtons divided by 49,035 meters per second equals 0 0.041 kilograms per second. If we need to process 126 kilograms, that means it will take 3,098 seconds. So we can calculate that it will take about 52 minutes to process our propellant through the engines. The Apollo missions, using the Saturn 4B third stage, had more thrust, but much less efficiency, less than 10% the efficiency of what we have. The S-4B third stage had a fueled or wet mass of 119,000 kilograms and a dry mass of 10,000 kilograms, with a specific impulse of 421 seconds. They needed about 90% of the third stage to be propellant, but their more powerful J-2 engine did produce over 1 million newtons of thrust allowing Apollo 8 to do their injection burn in only 318 seconds, which is about five minutes, creating an injection velocity of 10.82 kilometers per second. If we had 7.8 kilometers per second in low Earth orbit and added 3.2 kilometers per second of delta V, we'll have 11 kilometers per second to raise our apogee out to the moon, just like Apollo. The Apollo spaceship then ditched the spent third stage and flew on toward the moon with the command service and lunar modules. That S-4B stage is still out there, by the way, having missed the moon and gone on into orbit around the sun, just waiting for you to build a ship and go get it for a museum. Recently, it was announced that part of a SpaceX rocket was about to hit the moon. I know how much the media loves to hate on Elon right now, but I immediately knew that this should be impossible. When a Falcon 9 rocket takes a satellite to low Earth orbit, it usually waits until it is a safe distance from the satellite and then relights its engine to bring its perigee within Earth's upper atmosphere, allowing it to burn up. The Falcon 9 second stage is made mainly of aluminum, lithium alloy, and carbon fiber. If the Falcon goes to a higher orbit and cannot immediately deorbit, it still tries to put itself into a decaying orbit, so it eventually burns up in the atmosphere. No part of a Falcon 9 would normally generate enough delta V to get to the moon after putting a satellite into orbit. The only thing that should be orbiting out far enough to hit the moon are rockets that were sent to the moon or beyond. 
and it turned out to be a Chinese rocket. Now identified as a 2014-065B third stage booster that launched the Chang'e 5T1 on a Long March 3C rocket. If you want to brush up on China's space program, we have a lesson here. The Long March 3C is a three-stage rocket with boosters. The boosters and first two stages are hypergolic. Unsymmetric dimethylhydrazine added to dinitrogen tetroxide. The third stage is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fuel. The Chang'e 5T1 was a lunar sample return mission experiment. It entered Earth orbit in 2014, having used up the boosters and first two stages. With the third stage, then taking it out of Earth orbit, the third stage was released after the propellant was expended on a translunar injection burn, leaving the third stage in orbit between the Earth and Moon. The third stage burn sent the DHF-3A service module with a total mass of 2,215 kilograms, 1,065 kilograms of which was propellant, and the Chang'e 5 re-entry capsule with a mass of 335 kilograms on a free return trajectory. After separating from the Chang'e 5, the DHF-3A fired its own engines, ending up being sent out to L2 over here while the Chang'e 5 returned to Earth and landed in Inner Mongolia eight days after launch. So it looks like it's this third stage booster that's about to smack the moon. Hopefully not near any of these sites. SpaceX hasn't sent anything to the moon, but we, with our home-built spacecraft, are about to. So we ignite our ion drives, generating the needed delta V, and fly to the moon. We've packed some sandwiches, because it will take a while. It took Apollo 8 68 hours to get to the moon, and they had to make some tiny course corrections. We might also. Though they went into orbit around the moon, we are going to cross in front, as you see here. We just need to make sure our flight computer is accurate, and that we chose a good date and time for our launch, so that the moon will be where we needed to be when we get there. And we had to light our engines at the right place in Earth orbit which would be the opposite side of the Earth from where the moon's going to be. It also turns out the Earth's gravity well is much steeper than the moon's. We climb slowly up until their respective gravity fields are equal. Apollo 8 was 377,349 kilometers from the Earth at their greatest distance. And this equal gravity point was just 62,377 kilometers from the moon. The moon's gravity is one-sixth that of Earth, and the halfway point for gravity is about one-sixth the distance from the moon to the Earth. This is where we will find a spot called L1, or Earth-Moon Lagrange point 1. Since the Earth-Moon gravity is balanced here, we could hang out without using much propellant to stay in place, relative to the Earth and Moon. We had several options when we chose our flight path. Apollo 8 fired a lunar orbit insertion burn so they could stay around the moon. We won't, since we need to get back home before anyone gets worried. Every orbit must have two foci. We could have chosen the Earth and the moon, like Apollo 8. They crossed in front of the moon in its orbit. This allows the moon's gravity to pull them back and slow them down, helping them to get into orbit around the moon. They did a lunar orbit insertion burn and orbited the moon a few times traveling around the far side of the moon. We have chosen something different. We have chosen to use L1 as the other foci of our orbit. This way we never lose sight of our home planet. It is possible to use the hills and valleys created in space-time by gravity in this way. We are not moving fast enough to crest the hill and fall toward the moon. We travel around this curve, shown in a diagram where they make the gravitational landscape two-dimensional. Here we reach the apogee of our orbit and get a close-up look at the moon. We don't really have to do anything at this point. We will slowly start to fall back toward the Earth. Having planned our trajectory correctly, we'll now head back home. Now we find ourselves coasting down this slope to the Earth. This is a long hill, and we start building up a lot of speed. We will, in fact, impact the Earth's atmosphere at over 11 kilometers per second. 
One of the most difficult things about spaceflight is re-entry. The Apollo capsules had these thick heat shields. We don't have one of those. We might think about firing our engines to come to a stop before we hit the atmosphere, but even with an efficiency of 5,000 seconds specific impulse and a mass of 1,874 kilograms, we would need 377 kilograms of propellant to stop our fall, and as soon as we came to rest, we would start falling again. But we started with only 200 kilograms of propellant, and we've already used 126. We have only 74 kilograms of propellant left. With a mass of 1,874 kilograms after burning our propellant to get here, and moving at 11,000 meters per second, we have a momentum of over 20 million kilogram meters per second. If we hit the atmosphere at this speed and momentum, we will generate a shock wave with a temperature of over 20,000 Kelvin. Now there will be a boundary layer of stagnant air between our ship and the atmosphere. This will prevent conduction and convection, but it does allow radiative heating. The photons generated by the shock wave will create a temperature of about 1,650 Kelvin against our ship, which is 1,377 Celsius or 2,511 Fahrenheit. Carbon fiber and even titanium cannot tolerate these temperatures. Things are going to get really bad really fast if we can't think of something. But remembering our classes at the Terran Space Academy, we came prepared. We knew that neutron star systems out of Germany doesn't just make our magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters. They also make something called MEAST. MEAST stands for Magnetohydrodynamic Enhanced Entry System for Space Transportation. The European Union has invested 3.5 million euros into this research. This system uses a powerful superconducting magnet to generate a large rotating magnetic field around the ship. Ions are then released into the field to create a physical shell that will interact with the atmosphere and create resistance, greatly increasing the effective surface area and therefore reducing the mass to surface area ratio. Reducing this ratio increases the braking rate and reduces terminal velocity. We'll still have to make sure to come in at the right angle. If you brake too fast, you could generate too many g-forces and injure yourself. But if we brake too slowly, we'll have a longer heat pulse, increasing our heat load and causing a problem in most ships. The re-entry angle of the Apollo capsules was about six degrees, but our magnetic ion force field will hold the shock wave further back from the ship. Since radiative energy reduces by the distance squared, we can keep the shock wave away from the ship and prevent too much heat transfer. We have the superconducting magnets and our applied field magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters ready. We feed most of our power to the magneto shell, saving some to generate ions creating our magneto shell. The magnetic field created grabs the plasma and holds it around the ship. The sphere extends out far from the ship. Magneto shells of up to 100 meters in diameter are believed to be possible. This shell of ions actually impacts the Earth's atmosphere, where the ship's kinetic energy causes the atmosphere to heat and then becomes plasma. But the plasma from the atmosphere is conductive, like all plasma is. The magnetic field grabs this plasma and adds it to our shield, reinforcing it. And as the distance from our ship to the shock wave is now much further away, the radiated heat is much less. No problem for our ship. Once the ship slows from the friction of this giant plasma sphere, the shock wave dissipates. Without the shock wave generating plasma, our sphere starts to fade away, as magnetic fields cannot move neutral air particles. And we are almost out of propellant. So we angle our ship down a little and feed air through our atmospheric ion engine scoops. Not for propulsion, but to maintain our plasma shield. The ship continues to slow until reaching terminal velocity, which, with such a large surface area, is only about 150 kilometers per hour. At this speed, we can turn off our magneto shell and just use our engines with ducted fans to slow our descent and land gently in our driveway. We hope you've enjoyed this thought experiment. I know I enjoyed writing it. If you want to read more about high temperature superconductors, air breathing ion engines, magnetohydrodynamic thrusters, and magneto shells, follow the links in the description. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out our Academy store and stay safe at Astro Proterra.